Hey, it's Craig. I just wanted to let you know that you can listen to Canadian History X early and ad-free on Amazon Music, included with Prime. Greetings and welcome to another episode of Canadian History X. Before I continue, if you'd like to support the podcast, you can. Just go to patreon.com slash Canada EHX. I'm also hosting a Zoom history conference, free, on September 27th at 2 p.m. Mountain Standard Time. It's all about the 1915 Edmonton Flood, the worst flood in the history of the city. If you want to register, just email me at craig at canadaehx.com. I have a big dog, and his name is Boromir, but I call him Boris. And he's a part Newfoundland dog, so I have a special affinity for those types of dogs. And that's when I came across the story of Gander, or Sergeant Gander, who fought in the Battle of Hong Kong. And I mean that. He fought in the Battle of Hong Kong. He protected wounded soldiers, and he gave his life to protect them and ensure that they could live another day. It's a really great story with a sad ending, but a heroic ending. Gander would go on to get a statue. The Hong Kong veterans would ensure that his name was on the veteran's wall. And he was awarded the Dickin Medal which is given to animals who go above and beyond in war. For the past few years now, I've been talking to a man by the name of J.P. Bear, and he's been putting together a film about Gander. It's a really great idea, it's a really great story to tell, and he was able to take time to speak with me about the documentary and about Gander, and, well, let's get right to the interview. What got you interested in the story of Gander? I'm a U.S. Army vet from the Vietnam era. And um, I owned four Newfoundland dogs. The last was a Lancer. She was white and black. Her name was Supu. She was 10 and a half when I had to put her down. But she was a, um, a great therapy dog that would go to the schools and libraries where children to improve their readings, their reading skills, they would... Um, Uh, read to her books that they had at the libraries, at the schools. Uh, And then I started passing out materials about Newfoundland dogs to them so they could learn about the breed and about various Newfoundland dogs, one of which was Sergeant Gander. And uh, the more I heard and read about this story and the more I put out there, the more I got interested in this story. And eventually... It was kind of ironic. I, I was so into wanting, I had seen the film War Horse. And, um, and after I saw that, I thought, you know, this would be a great story, a film about Gander and his, his Battle of Hong Kong involvement. I contacted the, the co-authors of the book, A, Newfoundland, uh, a Dog Named Gander, uh, uh, Sergeant Major George McDaniel and Sue Beard in Toronto, and I visited them. And even though I'm a little insane to go from Phoenix in in February, I went to Toronto, where it was about 25 below. And and I said, hey, I'm here to to promote this. Um, So that's how I got interested in this. Uh, So tell me a bit about uh, Sergeant Gander. Okay. Um, I don't know how much you want me to go into it, but basically he was born April 15th, 1935. He was uh, the only pup in the litter for his mother, which probably made her happy. (laughs) And he, about three years later, became the father of 10 pups in July of 1938. Uh, One of the things about him was that He was nothing more than a family pet. He went from being the father in Botwood, Newfoundland, and moving to Gander to join the Rod Hayden family to become their family pet and the best friend of their three-year-old son, Jack. Um, Gander was always known for his size. He was about 90 kilograms. And he stood up just under two meters when he stood up on his hind legs. So he actually towered over a lot of people. Um, In fact, his handler with with the uh, Fred Kelly was only five foot three. So he was 
quite the uh, gander was quite the tall one. Um, but he he was a, as I say, a family pet. And he also, Rod Hayden, who was the refueling manager for the Shell Oil Company out of the U.S., was in charge of the Newfoundland Airport refueling system for the military planes that would fly in to Gander being the last airport they could get to and the largest one at the time in the world. They they fly in, they refuel, and then they would take off for Britain to help in World War II um, to prevent the uh, saboteurs or possible sabotage, which never really happened um, at, at the airport of the planes, uh, the Royal Rifles were brought in later, uh, actually in July of 1940, and they became the uh, new the, the security unit. But in January um, of 40, Gander was in the wintertime would give rides to the kids in the neighborhoods for the um, uh, on sleds in, throughout the streets of Gander. And he was, Gander, uh, Pal was his original name. Pal would give the rides to the kids. Well, Rod Hayden realized that with his size, Pal being as big as he was, could probably harness up to a four-wheel sled and tow a, a, a 50-gallon drum or maybe two. So he hooked him up, got him set, and Pal was noted to be the first refueling vehicle of Newfoundland Airport. He would take the, and tow the, the drums over to the, the planes, and then they would get refueled, and he did this. Well, he was known to take naps when he wasn't working, and he would nap on the tarmac <laughs> on the runways. And the pilots, in fact, Douglas Fraser, the very first pilot to ever land a plane at uh, Newfoundland Airport, he quoted, uh, radioed in that there was a bear sleeping on the runway. And they realized it was Pal, and they told him to get up and get off. He was known to do that quite often, but um, you know, it was comical. Um, after, in, after the Royal Rifles arrived at Newfoundland Airport, the, um, the kids were playing with Gander a lot. He was always known to stand up, put his paws on shoulders, and then he would uh, give him a big kiss. Well, that was his trademark. Unfortunately, uh, January 9th, 1941, the kids decided to play, uh, play around in the snow. They were making snowmen, and they were also having a snowball fight. Well, he decided to jump in there and start to protect them and to play with them. As he did, he jumped up on Joan Chafe, and uh, she was about six years old at the time, uh, or excuse me, eight years old at the time. He jumped up, hit, went to hit her on her shoulders and give her a kiss, but he missed her and he scratched her face. Till the day she died, she had those scratches on her face, and her sister Eileen told me all about it. But, <laughs> um, but you know, the the uh, Mrs. Ethel Hayden, Jack's mother, was so concerned that Pal would, because of his size, that he would hurt one of the children in the neighborhood. He decided she decided to have Rod find him another home. So he went to the Royal Rifles Lieutenant Commander, Lieutenant Colonel Home, stationed at the airport, and asked him if they would maybe like him as a mascot. So after some discussion, they decided yes, and they accepted Pal to be their, their regimental mascot. Um, shortly after he arrived in the unit, the men in 
decided they wanted him renamed Gander in honor of the the airport the and the village where he was from. So they changed his name to Gander, hence uh, that was made. And then uh, the MP commander, uh, Maurice, De, I'll butcher the name, it's uh, <laughs> Francis D. Diavion or something. Um, he wanted Gander to be an MP because of his his size, his quickness, and his sense of smell and his eye his eyesight. So he was made a, a military police attachment, and and they said, well, he's got to have a rank. So they n- promoted him to sergeant had a big ceremony for it. And they, on his collar, they put the three stripes for the sergeant on his collar and he gave him a kit bag with a brush and his, his food bowl. And so, um, but after he was with the unit from in January of 41, and then they left they got their orders on the 12th of October to leave to join World War II, the Second World War involvement. And they left Gander, went to Valcartier, joined, got on the trains and went across the, the, country, the Canadian uh, country. And as they would stop at villages, they would parade. Well, it was known that at all parades, Sergeant Gander with his handler, rifleman Fred Kelly, would lead all parades. So they got off the trains, they'd go through the towns of Montreal, Quebec City, um, on and on, all the way through until they reached Winnipeg. When they got to Winnipeg, they were joined with the Winnipeg Grenadiers. And the Grenadiers were be, with the Royal Rifles of Canada became Sea Force. And they were attached to each other. They marched and then they went on their way to Vancouver. They arrived in Vancouver on October 26th. And the next morning, they left for Hong Kong, but they had a slight glitch getting on the ships, the Awatea and the Prince Robert. Well, the Awatea was pretty easy because it was just all the men and that was it. The Prince Robert was going to have Gander with his uh, company from the Royal Rifles. Well, they went to get on the ship and the Uh, F.G. Hart, the commander of the ship, said, hey, wait, wait, no, there is not going to be a bear on my ship. And they said, no, 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 he's a dog, you know, he's a Newfoundland dog, and and they explained it. And they they even told him he's going to be part of our security for the ship to keep an eye out for things. So, So he agreed to letting them do that, and they continued on. Um, three weeks later, they arrived, November 16th, they arrived in Hong Kong. They disembarked, paraded with Sergeant Gander and Kelly at the front, and Seaforce showed the Chinese in, in Kowloon, actually. Hong Kong was the island across the way. Anyway, in Kowloon, they, they went through to the Sham Shui Po barracks where they were going to be stationed until the end of the war, which didn't happen. Um, they ended up, uh, the Chinese were just so amazed at the size of this dog. They ended up, the Battle of Hong Kong began five hours after the bombing of Pearl Harbor. But because of the date line, the date in Hong Kong was December 8th, as opposed to December 7th in Pearl Harbor in Hawaii. So a lot of people look at the calendar and go, oh, it was the, it was the next day. No, it was. It was the same day. The Japanese attacked and they bombarded and shelled 
for over uh, 10 days, the uh, areas on the island where the defense was set up for the the 1,976 men, actually 1,975. One gentleman, 38-year-old Dave Schrag, died of um, diabetic coma because of improper insulin that he didn't take on the Abatea coming over to Hong Kong. So they lost one man that was buried at sea. Um, throughout it all, the battle really didn't start uh, as far as the invasion until the night of the 18th. It was the, the Canadians were told when they left the Sham Shui Po barracks, they were told that they were to burn the fuel, start the, start the uh, fuel tanks or the huge tanks of fuel for the island and for the village, um, they were told to burn them because they didn't want the Japanese to get that fuel. Hence, there was this huge plume of smoke for 10 days going over. It was, they said it was like being in Los Angeles now, you know, smog. <laughs> but uh, but um, they ended up, uh, it was 10 o'clock at night, 2200 hours when they had, they began their attack coming from the uh, over the Limon passage into um, onto the Hong Kong Island. Now the Royal Rifles uh, company where Gander was stationed was at the Limon passage which was only about 1400 uh, meters from uh, Kowloon. So it was a very short distance. I mean, it's not even a mile. And they, the Japanese had, well, let me back up. The British intelligence had said the Japanese soldiers were not fierce fighters. They were short. They ate rice. They had poor eyesight. They were not wanting to fight at night. And they did not fight in the rain. With, and they would be about maybe 5,000 troops. Well, the 1,975 Canadians expected only about three times their size of unit and didn't think it would be much of a threat. As it was, the Japanese were very fierce and it was not anything true. And there were over 60,000 troops of the Japanese that made the invasion attack. So it was like the Alamo in the United States where you have a, not even 200 guys up against 6,000. So about 30 to one. Um, on the night of the 18th and 19th was the initial fight or the battle began with the invasion. As the Japanese would come across and get off in, into the water off of their boats or whatever they were on, uh, they would run onto the beach. Well, Gander starts charging at them, barking and snarling and growling and jumping on them and knocking them out and biting them. And these Japanese, you got to remember, it's black at night. You got all the smoke. You got all the, it's a cloudy night. It's, there's no moon out. So there's no lights. It's not like, you know, oh, it's daytime and I can see everything. They couldn't see anything, and people later asked, why didn't the Japanese just shoot him? I said, it's like being in a closet with a black dog, door closed, and you can't see anything, and he's, he's hitting you, and he's biting you, and you're like, what are you going to shoot? So, you know, it was it was comical that, that later it was said they should have shot him, but, you know, nobody thought of that. Um, as it was... The uh, Japanese started to surround the island. And as they approached from all the different angles, they were overwhelming the Canadians. And there were numerous, numerous casualties building up. Um, out of that, all of a sudden, there was in the company area of the Royal Rifles, Gander was going from 
pillbox to pillbox, trying to find some place to find calm. And he couldn't. And then as he noticed the men were being attacked, he would go out to help them also. So eventually, seven wounded soldiers, Canadians, were laid in a ditch. As they laid in the ditch, waiting to be taken to the first aid kit uh, tent for first aid treatment, they were laying there. And on the other side of the, of the road that they were in a ditch of was a ravine. And the Japanese were on the bottom of the ravine, and they started throwing grenades towards the, the Canadian soldiers in the ditch. And they would throw them. Well, a Canadian grenade, unlike an American or, or uh, a Japanese grenade, excuse me, Japanese grenade, unlike an American grenade, it's not a ball. It was a stick similar to the, the Germans' uh, grenades. And they would throw it, and it had a, a fuse. And the fuse, you could see it burning down. So they would quickly grab it and throw it back to the Japanese, giving them uh, their own gift. Uh, so they're doing this. As the grenades are coming in, these wounded soldiers, the ones that are ambulatory enough to do it, are grabbing them and throwing them back. But eventually, one grenade, one grenade, lands out of their reach. And all of a sudden, a black blur runs into the scene, picks up the grenade, and runs it out of sight, back to the Japanese. As he had been seeing what, what was going on. So all of a sudden, boom! And the men relax. And they go, wow, that grenade's not a threat to us now. That's great. And then suddenly they realized that one of their soldiers, their fellow soldiers, had sacrificed his todays for their tomorrows. And it was Gander, was that black blur. He was not trained to do anything militarily. He was just a family pet. He was a mascot. But he later became a soldier and a hero by saving those men. I spoke with Sergeant Major McDaniel, and as I told him of reading this story and hearing about Gander and what he did for his men, I asked him that when I said, I'm, I'm writing this film and I have to have somebody that doesn't like him. And he, he says, there wasn't one person in our unit that didn't like him. And I said, okay, so I'll make somebody up. And I, I found somebody and, you know, uh, I did that. But, you know, it's, he was so beloved by his men. Um, in 1995, Gander, now Gander died in 1941. The Battle of Hong Kong lasted till Christmas Day, 1941. So it went on for 17 days. And these men ended up being POWs and in work camps for 44 months after they were captured. Now, they didn't, the Canadians never surrendered. They were told by the British, lay your weapons down. We've surrendered for you. And uh, they ended up being, it was horrible. They, they lost a quarter of their unit between the battle and the POW camps till 1945 when they were released uh, and, and saved. But these men, to a man, love that dog. And in, in 19, in 2000, um, uh, on, on, on October 27th, actually 59 years after they had left Vancouver, on the ships, 59 years later, they awarded the Dickin Medal to Gander for the, the PDSA Dickin Medal, which is considered the animal's Victoria Cross. Why do you feel that Gander's story still resonates to, uh, to this day, uh, especially in Canadian history? Well, 
the, the Canadians that I've spoken to, the veterans and the family members of the veterans and the people who knew Pal as a civilian before he became uh, the mascot and soldier of the Royal Rifles, they all to a person felt that to have a dog with them was so, he was so beloved and they, they cared for him so much and his actions, no matter what he did, whether it was pulling a sled, whether it was towing a, a thing, sleeping on a tarmac, the men wanted to go swimming. And he would be the Newfoundland dog that would jump in and rescue them from swimming. And they like, yeah, got to keep him away from the lake. <laughs> um, but, but, you know, he was so beloved. And here these men were, they were, 18, 17, 18, 19 year old kids. They, they, were, they were volunteers. The entire unit was volunteers. And, uh, and that's one thing I love about Canada. I, I want you to know, um, you, you guys, you don't have a draft. You guys see, see a problem and you unified and you go and say, we're gonna take care of this. And that's what they did. And these guys, the Royal Rifles, the Winnipeg Grenadiers, they, they are the same way. And they didn't have their dogs or their animals or their family members with them at the units in Gander uh, or, or in Hong Kong. And here they were with this dog that reminded them of home. And, and you know, John Ted Wynn, uh, a good friend, has uh, been helping me with things on the film. And one thing he said is, what word, what one word would you say makes Gander stand out? And I said, home, mm -hmm. family, because he was their family member. And these, these men love that dog. And to me now, when you see units go overseas to fight terrorists and fight all these wars and, and get in these conflicts, um, you just, it gives you a part of home, a part of, of, hey, I got somebody that reminds me of mom, dad, and apple pie. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and I think that that's why it resonates so strongly. You know, I, I just, I love this dog and I love this story. And I love that it's a Canadian story. I, I'm, oh, I could go on forever. I'll shut up. <laughs> um, so in regards to the film, uh, tell me about, a bit about the film and kind of what, uh, what you'd like to get across with the film. Well, what I've, um, what I, uh, have done is it, I've been on a roller coaster ride. There's a lot of highs and lows. Um, one thing I I was a booking agent, and so I was used to. I've been known to deal with people. I put on benefits for uh, the burn center, and I've I've tried to help hum, the humane societies. And when I've done these benefits. I would talk to people and everybody wants to tell you what you want to hear. You know, they, Oh, Oh yeah. I'll tell you what I'm going to, Oh yeah. I'm a, I know a producer. I know this, I know that. And they want you to believe that they're going to help you get something accomplished. And through this roller coaster ride, I have learned not to get all my, put all, put all my eggs in one basket. I listen to people. I work with them. I, I work with yourself. Um, and I've, I don't, when, when I ask somebody a question, I don't expect them to tell me gospel what's being answered. I expect them just to be honest and say, look, I'll do my best. I'll, I'll help you if I can. I'll, I'll give this person a call. And if that helps, Great. If it doesn't, so be it. I, um, I, I think that with that, I've changed the genre. 
I started out, it's a full length feature film, era authentic. The budget, 50 to $75 million. I do play the lottery. And if I win big, then I'll have my money. <laughs> but unfortunately, I don't expect it, you know. Lord hasn't said, yeah, we'll help you. <laughs> but um, <laughs> but, but I've, I've changed the genre at the recommendations of various people. Uh, I started out, as I say, a full-length feature. And then I was told by one of the Netflix producers that rel- uh, has relatives that live in Gander, grew up in Gander. And he said, you know, you might want to, my, my brother, he does TV miniseries, uh, Frontier. You might want to do a TV miniseries, you know. So I rewrote it. <laughs> and then all of a sudden it's like, well, you know, maybe a docudrama would be good. Now, another producer mentioned. And I said, okay. So I changed it to a docudrama, a documentary with, with some inflection of lies <laughs> as I call it <laughs> but you know just make the story exciting um, and then I was informed you know if you can do a straight dem- dem- documentary you might be able to get it done for $10,000 or $50,000 but you know um, I've gotten a lot of commitments from people that are willing to help and give me advice and to help out but when it really comes down to it is that it's been, uh, as I say, a roller coaster ride. And I'm not going to, I'm not going to let this pandemic stop me from making connections. I've, I've been making connections with people in Winnipeg and Calgary. I just really, uh, you know, I think one of the, one of the, there's two, two mottos or mantras I have. Uh, throughout all of this, and, and I said them to Sergeant Major McDaniel, I've said them to Eileen Elms or Chafe, uh, the sister of Joan, the girl that got scratched. Um, I've said it to all these people, and basically, first of all, this is a Canadian story. There was a story about a dog, a Nikita, that was in New Hampshire in the United States with Richard Gere as a professor who dies and the dog ends up going to the train station. Uh, Kashi, I believe the dog's name was. And the film was an American US story, but it was in reality, a Japanese story. The Akita I was, was say, in Japan. that sounded Japan. really familiar, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and it was, it was and, but yet to make it a film, they made it mm-hmm. for the, U.S. and everybody jumps on that bandwagon, and, and it's a good story. I love the story. I, I do cry, you know. Um, but this is a Canadian story, and as I said to one person, I said, "And it's a Newfoundland dog. It's not a Chihuahua. <laughs> it's not a cat. You know, it is a Newfoundland dog." Um, and I'm going to be. I I just I live by that. And, and the other thing is, after talking to these people, these men that were there with him and that fought against this tyrannical Japanese war machine, that what they endured, those men, this is a story that needs to be told. Mm. And it is not told in Canadian schools. Shoot, I, I've given speeches and presentations here in the in Phoenix, Arizona of the US because I want this story out there and I want everybody to know it. Mm-hmm. And if I can do anything to help, I'm gonna get it done. I'm not gonna sit on my laurels and say, well you know I wrote this film and maybe somebody will pick it up. No, I'm pushing. Mm-hmm. I am the squeaky wheel. You know, I drink WD forty in the morning <laughs> just to get going. So <laughs> But I drink um, Pepsi the rest of the day. <laughs> um, so in regards to Gander, uh, you mentioned the Dickens Medal, but what are some other ways that he's been honored, uh, especially recently? Well, okay. Um, so he received the Dickens Medal in 2000. And 
ironically, and, and let me just point this out, Sergeant, uh, Company Sergeant Major John Osborne received the first Victoria Cross for World War II actions for a Canadian soldier. And he was at the Battle of Hong Kong. On the same night that he was doing that, uh, his action of jumping on a grenade to save his men, he was also gander on the other side of the island was j taking a grenade and running it away from his men to save his men. So they did the same action for the same reason, to help their brethren. And these guys ended up receiving the v Animal Victoria Cross, the Dick and Medal, and Osborne received the Victoria Cross. But I um, uh, in 2009, the Remembrance Wall for the Battle of Hong Kong defense was uh, unveiled and displayed in Ottawa um, on August 15th of 2009. And on that wall is every person and dog's name on that that was involved with the Battle of Hong Kong. Ironically, in its alphabetical position, all to a to a man, every veteran demanded that Gander's name be put in there, and not as at the end of the thing or, or an add-on. It was in his proper alphabetical order. And then in 2012, on July 1st, uh, a young man, well, he was 11 years old, he, uh, Noah Trembley, out of Bass River, Nova Scotia, he got this idea, he, he involved himself in a school uh, um, project, a heritage and science fair, and he wanted a monument that he wanted to have made in honor of gander and all other animals that were service uh, connected for the military, uh, the RCMP, and police dogs. And he wanted these animals and their handlers to be honored with this monument. Well, he's now 20 and he's in the university, his third year in the university. And he basically by himself with some help from his family and, and a couple teachers got raised $21,000 to have Clifton Sears make this monument. And next to the monument with all the names of these dogs and, and handlers um, was the first one listed was Gander and the Royal Rifles uh, of Canada. And uh, next to it is a statue of Gander watching over the monument, keeping his eye on it. And um, Noah did this on his own. And now he's had to add over 140 names. Well, he couldn't do it to another monument because it costs so much. So what he did was he had benches made. And he had benches made. And the benches were would have the names on them. So he's got, I, I believe, four or five at this time, but he's added 140 names already, and he says he gets more all the time. Um, and <clears throat> that's in Bass River at the Bass River he Veterans Memorial Park in Nova Scotia. And if you get a chance, and, and nobody knew about this. Nobody, I found this out about, a month ago, that's how fresh this is. Uh, and um, in 2015, in Gander, Newfoundland, at the Gander Heritage Memorial Park, a statue of Gander, Sergeant Gander, and of his handler, 
Royal Rifleman, Royal Rifles of Canada Rifleman Fred Kelly. Now Fred's, it's not it's not for sure it's Fred, but it's it's a soldier standing next to Gander, and the soldier represents all the men that were involved at the Battle of Hong Kong, and they uh, unveiled this in the rain. And I, I just wanted to to read real quick what Bill Doddridge said at the ceremony. And he said he was a rifleman who knew D Gander. And he said, it's very emotional talking about it. It's very close to my heart. Gander was very much loved by all of us. He followed us to Hong Kong and was killed in action. And that's that's his story. Mm -hmm. These men love that dog. And I want to honor those men for their actions at the Battle of Hong Kong and their their internment with the Japanese at the camps. And, and I want to honor Gander and all these other dogs. In fact, Noah's statue or monument is, is labeled Forgotten Heroes because every Everybody knows or feels, especially in the military, how much the dogs mean to these people. Mm -hmm. And 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 ha having an animal, it brings it home. It's family. And then the last question is uh, in regards to people who are interested in the film, if they want to get in touch with you, if somebody listening maybe has a story about Gander or knows somebody has a story about Gander, or they just want to help out in any way, uh, what exactly can they do? How do they contact you? Um, well, I have a website. It's, uh, <clears throat> pull out my little business card here. <laughs> <laughs> I just, just happen to have a few. <laughs> um, but, but it's, uh, and I, I want you to know, on the website, there are pictures of, Newfoundland dogs. Mm -hmm. Any picture that is black and white is original for, and it, it is pal or gander, mm -hmm. and, and it's original. Um, and on my website is uh, www.sergeantgander film.com. Um, and I can be reached, and I'm willing, I take phone calls, I don't care, I'm not proud. Uh, <laughs> I uh, my phone number is six two three eight seven nine nine zero two seven. I um, have a uh, uh, what I tried a Kickstarter program to try to get some funding to help with my expenses. Uh, that went nowhere. Uh, so I tried a GoFundMe account, and I have a GoFundMe account, and you can, it hooks up through the website. And it also, if you just go to GoFundMe and look up J.P. Bear Film, Sergeant Gander Film, um, it, it shows up there too. And there's this fine trailer that I have that I show to the production companies. Um, you might know of somebody that maybe had a lot to do with this. <laughs> <laughs> so, and, and I'm very grateful, very grateful. It, and, it, was, it was my pleasure to make it, no worries. Uh, it's a, it was so much fun, and I I can't tell you how many times I've showed that, and it's on the GoFundMe account. It's also you can just go to YouTube and pull up the JB Bear film, and it's there. I just I, I'm trying what I can. I'm financially not. I, I'm retired. I'm old, <laughs> um, but but I'm. I am not going to let anything stop me from getting this done. I have one of my one of my uh, favorite people that is on my team is uh, Laura Bettini Munoz, and um, she is John Wayne's granddaughter. And we talked, and I said, "Oh, you know," and I told her this story, and I have a scene. I have a scene in the film at the end of the film and it, I, I, I told it to her 
and it, basically it is it's about it's an old man and, and a young uh, uh, an elderly man a young boy and a Newfoundland dog and they approach the um, remembrance wall and the boy walks over and looks at this names on the on this monument and he points at one particular name of a fallen soldier and he said he turns and looks at the old man and says that's him right grandpa he was your best friend and the old man looks at him and wipes a tear from his eye and nods yes and a smile and at the schools i asked the kids when we we would act this out and I'd show it to them and I'd say, can anybody tell me who any of these people up here are? The dog, the little boy or the old man? And they all say, uh, hands go up and uh, Jack, it's the little boy who was his best friend. And it's so important that people know this story. And it's so important that I can tell it. And it is so important that I want so much to get this done. I would love to have it done tomorrow. I would love to say, you know, because everybody asked me, when's it going to be on the film? Yeah. I want to see it. So do I. But, <laughs> you know, I, I can only do so much. But I will keep working at it. Um, and, you know, it's just an honor. And I'm humbled that the Lord has given me the opportunity to take this story and tell it. And I, 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 yeah, I love Newfoundland dogs. I always have, you know, if I couldn't own a black Panther, then I wanted to own a Newfoundland dog. So I did. <laughs> I hope you enjoyed that interview with JP Barron. If you did give a rating and review, you can reach me at Craig at Canada, ehx.com. You can find hundreds of articles on Canada's history as well as all my podcast episodes at CanadaEHX.com. Thanks, and we'll see you again next time.